10 stories from a 16-year-old girl whose twin sister is taken in a violent act to a woman in Cuba who finds her deceased brother's bones have been stolen. 10 stories and the search for freedom. I'm Ann Bocock and welcome to Between the Covers. It is such a pleasure to welcome Patricia Engel. Her previous book, Infinite Country, was an instant New York Times bestseller. Her novels have won major awards and the praise for her writing includes adjectives like this, powerful, illuminating, breathtaking, riveting. Her new book is a collection of 10 short stories. The title is a faraway world. Welcome, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. You have received such glowing reviews and such wonderful praise. So I'm reading your work and the one word that keeps coming back to me is storyteller. You are a wonderful storyteller. So I wanna know who told you stories growing up? Oh, I love this question because it's true. I grew up on stories. Um, I come from a very large family, a very creative family. There are a lot of musicians and artists in my family. But because my family came from Colombia to the United States, very often through that experience, the only thing you have to hold on to your homeland are your stories. And because you've had to leave so much behind, that's often our greatest inheritance. So my stories came from all around me, uh, from my grandmother who was a writer, from my grandfather who came from Austria, from my parents who immigrated to the United States, and all my aunts and uncles who had their own stories inside this larger family story. So I, I was surrounded by stories. You are genetically predisposed to being a storyteller. There, there's no <laughs> question. The book is a faraway world. It's a collection of 10 stories, they are linked, and the theme would be migration, the Latin diaspora. Talk about that as a collection, if you would. Well, uh, the stories in the faraway world were written over the past 10 years or so while I was writing other books, but um, short stories is my first love, perhaps, um, maybe even more so than novels. Um, I love that they're just like micro worlds and you can get in deep with some characters for a short time before you move on to something else. And these stories are all united in that um, they explore different characters from def very different lives who in some way or another are looking beyond where they are, are dreaming of something larger or are aching for something that they've left behind in some way. So um, they're, they're united in that kind of yearning, um, a lot of times sacrifice, um, love, um, and all sorts of compromises. I would think that short stories would be harder than a novel because it's, it's compressed into however many words or pages or paragraphs, mm -hmm. and, and you, you have to get it done in that small time frame. Yeah, they are, uh, you could say, just as hard or harder. Um, each story, whether it's a short story or novel, presents its own challenges. Um, it's just a, a different experience with when you're reading a short story you dive in deep quickly it's like a you know quick love affair whereas uh, a novel is a sustained relationship with a book um, that takes much longer um, you know to to get through in this book this we are talking about the human race which is migratory and and frankly for survival the human race has had to migrate most of us have an immigrant story in our ancestry. But I think what happens is that over time, over generations, the language fades, the stories fade. As a writer, why do you think it's so important to tell these stories? I think we all know that when stories are lost or forgotten, they just disappear, right? And perhaps we forget lessons that somebody in our lineage already learned. <laughs> and we just, uh, it's like starting from scratch. Um, but it's true that all of us have st uh, 
a history of movement somewhere in our lineage. Maybe it's so far behind us that we've lost the connection to it. And those like me, for example, who are, who are the child of immigrants, we have that story very close. Um, and it's still very much alive and active in, in our life condition. Um, but, but that's not to say that it doesn't exist within everybody somehow. And the longer our memory extends, well, the more power, the more knowledge, and the more humanity we contain. Immigration in this book, it, it's, it is complex. Now, the story of immigration is complex anyway, but what I gather from reading, for most of your characters, it's a tug of war. They are wanting something better, but then in some cases feel like they are losing part of themselves in the process. Is that correct? Certainly, my experience as a witness of immigration um, from different sides throughout my life um, has been, my observations have been that it's a very nuanced and very complicated um, condition. We have this idea in, in the United States presented by the media and, um, you know, different sources of information that uh, information, that immigration is like walking through a door, the door closes and that's it, you're here, you've arrived and, and the, the, the old country is sort of lost behind you somewhere. In fact, it's quite different. There's a lot of complicated feelings around it. And the fact is most people um, in this world would choose not to leave the home that they love, the family they love, the community that knows them and loves them in order to start over in a place that is where they know nobody, where they have no resources, where they don't speak the language, and a place that is more often than not not very welcoming. Nobody would really choose that if they didn't have to. Um, so I've always tried to write into that space of discovering what um, motivates different people to make those very hard decisions and embrace the whole picture that is, of course, the desire for something better, but also the love and appreciation and respect for what came before. That was so well said. And my takeaway from some of your characters is that immigration does not start and stop at the border. It is ongoing, it is a process, and for some of these characters, it is lifelong. Sure, and uh, as a result of the modern world, everything we benefit from in terms of technology, we're able to stay in contact with, um, you know, uh, places beyond our borders um, much easier, which keeps connections alive, perhaps in ways that we weren't allowed to do before. In my parents' generation, they were limited to very expensive phone calls that could not happen very often, right. or letters that may or may not arrive. Right now we have email, we have WhatsApp, we have text. I mean, WhatsApp has changed the world, really. Um, we have travel that's m more affordable and, and uh, easier ways to move about the world. So of course, um, this brings up this notion of um, trans diaspora, which is not just that you leave a place, but that you can go back and maintain a relationship and a connection to a place that you've uh, left behind. So yeah, the, the condition, the immigrants condition is an ever-changing one um, and it's uh, it's complex and and uh, it's quite beautiful and I hadn't thought about the evolution and how technology mm -hmm. has, has played a part but but that is that that's really quite important let's talk about setting mm -hmm. and travel and where your stories take place mm -hmm. they are all over the map and mm -hmm. I mean literally they are all mm -hmm. over the map did you do physical research? Have you been to many of these places? Yeah, I would say I've been to all the places that are where the stories are set. <laughs> all right, so let's talk yeah. about where they are. Okay, well, there are, there are, are stories set um, in the Northeast, in the New York, New Jersey area, which I know well. There are stories set in South Florida, which I also know well. <laughs> And there are stories set in Colombia, which is my parents' homeland. And there are three stories set in Cuba, um, where I spent a lot of time when I was doing research for my novel, uh, The Veins of the Ocean. So those stories sort of generated from that period uh, when I was spending a lot of time there. And I ask this because you really have an eye for place, an mm -hmm. eye for geographic detail, whether it is a town, or a neighborhood, and, and in one of the stories, it is simply a church. But you, in words, you can really make us feel like we are there. And I didn't know if that came from your seeing it and feeling it and experiencing, or you just a fabulous writer. 
Um, thank you. Well, that's something that's important to me as a reader. Certainly, as a reader, I like to um, feel that the, the author whose hands I'm in, in my reading experience, has a firm understanding of the place that they're writing about. And because I write about specific communities, I'm always writing for them because I want them to feel that I showed their, um, their community the respect of getting to know it well, getting details right. Um, there's the artistic part of it, which is really you just want to transport a reader so that they have a vivid and realistic reading experience. But the other part of it is being responsible with the details and to, um, to show the people who, for, for them that's home, the respect of getting it right. I think respect is the right word. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, place can be as important in these stories as the characters. Yeah, absolutely. I want people to get a sense of how beautiful your writing is and what a great storyteller you are. So mm -hmm. I'm going to let you choose. And if you would set up the paragraph, um, and I believe you're picking from the first story in the yeah. book. and. Let us hear from you. Sure, so I'm going to read from the first story, which is called Aida. And it's a story about twin, uh, teenage twin sisters. One of them goes missing. And through the um, learning about how she's gone missing, you learn that these two daughters um, really feel that they are responsible for keeping their parents who have sort of a troubled marriage together. So I'll read a paragraph that speaks to that. Aida and I considered ourselves their marriage counselors. It was like each of our parents had an only child. I was my father's daughter and Aida belonged to our mother. When the fights became so bad, we weren't sure they could make it back to each other on their own. Aida and I would assume our roles. I'd find our father alone in his study, hunched over his desk or slumped in the leather reading chair, staring out the window at nothing. Aida would go to their room, where our mother was always on the bed, lying fetal in her nightgown. Aida would tell me that our mother would often ask her who she loved best, and Aida would declare her devotion to our mother and say that if our parents ever split, Aida and our mother would run off together to Paris or Hong Kong. Aida would always tell me this part laughing, because we both knew she would never leave me and I would never leave our father. That was our trick. That was how we kept our family together. That's beautiful. Thank, Thank you for you. sharing that. Thank, Thank you, you for reading it. And I, I love any story that has to do with twins. This one was not what I expected, and mm -hmm. it was quite tragic and heartbreaking. And I'd like to look into a couple of the other storylines in this book. Mm -hmm. One of the stories, uh, Aguacero, did mm -hmm. I pronounce that? Aguacero, yeah. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> stand corrected. There are two strangers. Mm -hmm. They both have traumatic pasts. Mm -hmm. They're at a bus stop, I believe, where they meet each other for the first time. And it just shows like how a random meeting can change your life. Mm -hmm. Talk about that story, please. Yeah, well, I said it was a story set in New York City. Um, and uh, and I was said it means like a, rain, a heavy rainstorm. So there's these um, two strangers in New York who, in order to get out of a heavy rainstorm that's come on, they duck under the awning of a of one of those like cigarette shops that you know exist in Midtown Manhattan, and um, they end up you know having a very casual, superficial conversation. But to escape the rain, they duck into a coffee shop, and it leads to. Um, sort of a strange relationship. They are they are strangers who are both avoiding very painful things in their lives and making big decisions, and they find um, a momentary refuge in one another. That's not at all romantic. It's, you know, not even quite platonic. It's sort of something else, but it's very healing for both of them, and you 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 know become a part of that trajectory. One of the other stories, which is the first one that, that you read, Aida, there is a mm -hmm. violent incident. There are mm -hmm. twin girls. I am wondering if the trajectory would have been different if this wasn't an immigrant story. Well, I don't know. Um, it, it's just, that story is set in New Jersey, in a New Jersey suburb, where really, you know, um, Immigration is not really a part of the plot or the theme um, in any way. You, they, you just happen to learn through the course of the story that the father is French and the mother um, is the, the daughter of a Colombian diplomat. So she's spent her life sort of um, traveling about the world. 
And because of their parents' sort of cosmopolitan nature, these two girls are just a little bit strange for their typical suburban town. They're just a little bit, you know, um, out of place, although one fits in much more than the other. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's not really so much about immigration, it's just sort of about how, um, you know, some ways we fit or don't fit into the world that we exist in. You, you find that even within that family, the parents don't quite fit with each other. Um, mm -hmm. And it's kind of about finding your place in places that you have no choice but to exist in. Yeah, I felt like the, the surviving mm -hmm. daughter had felt like it was her responsibility now to mm -hmm. keep the family going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very often the case, you know, in, in a difficult marriage or family dynamics, the children feel a sense of responsibility. Um, that story actually came to me because I saw one of those um, documentary television, television shows, and it was about um, a family's daughter who had been kidnapped on her way to a rock concert. She, you know, she had been walking on a road, everyone saw her, she was there one minute and the next she was gone. And so through the course of this um, show, they interviewed the family members and I just saw how much pain this family was carrying and just talking about their daughter who had disappeared. And that stayed with me, you know, about the family that lives on, right? And, um, and that's where the story came from. I wanted to write about the family when the family that's barely hanging on to begin with is hit with something so massive. It is a beautiful, painful story. You said you wrote this over 10 years, the, mm -hmm. the, these different stories. So they were written at different times. Yes. But as I'm reading it, I'm thinking how particularly relevant they are now. Mm -hmm. Have we seen a shift in the perception to immigrants and immigration in those 10 years that it took you to write these stories? Um, well, I don't know. Each story contains its own world and is sort of written in its own terms. Um, and uh, of course, the world has been changing, you know, parallel to, to the writing of these stories. And I, I wrote three or four other novels <laughs> in, between, <laughs> in, the, in exactly. the meantime. <laughs> so I've always been exploring different things. But um, these stories are really just about people, and they're just about mm -hmm. people grappling with things that everyone deals with, which could be the loss of family members or with a love that is slipping out of your grasp um, or just wanting something better for your children. And, and I think those are you know, universal um, experiences. What was the first story that you wrote? In this, in book, this book, Fausto which is the second uh, story in the collection. My first book um, is a novel and short stories. It's called Vida. Mm -hmm. And I wrote Fausto um, very close to the time that I was completing that book. And Fausto is a story of um, set here in South Florida. And it's a, a young um, couple uh, who are crazy in love, um, sort of their whole community is kind of skeptical of them and thinks, you know, they're going nowhere in their lives. And their only dream is to get married and have a big wedding just so they can show everybody, like, look at us, we're getting married. And just to carry out that little goal, they get themselves involved in some big trouble. Um, Quite a bit of big trouble. <laughs> yes, uh, I don't think it gives much too much away to say that they get involved in, um, you know, uh, drug trafficking, <laughs> um, sort of in one of those peripheral ways, not really, you know, head on drug trafficking, mm -hmm. but they're one of the, the little movers in the larger operation. And you see what, what it does to them. Which of these stories was the most challenging? They're all challenging. Every story is like a puzzle while you're writing it. And it asks its own questions and you've got to find the answers. So that's kind of the magic and the mystery of writing a short story. Um, maybe one that I struggled with um, longer. Oh, Fausto took me many, many drafts actually, I should say. But another one that maybe took me um, a bit to figure out is one of the more unusual stories in the collection called The Book of Saints which is told in two voices, the voices of a husband and a wife, um, and it is um, structured at very different pivotal points in their relationship from their meeting until where they um, are now. Um, and uh, that was, story was a lot of fun to write because, again, I had these two opposing voices telling their version of the same story in different ways. 
but uh, it took some time to figure out. As far as things being a puzzle, is it also a puzzle when you structure a collection of short stories? I mean, it, you don't just go, well, here are 10, I'm putting them in. I mean, mm -hmm. is, is there a progression? Yeah, that's a great question. And I know a lot of writers really labor over that, you know, the order of the stories. I'm a lot more intuitive. I kind of go with my guts. So there's no, you know, I couldn't even tell you how they're really organized. I really just kind of um, try to imagine the reader's experience of going from one to the other, and it's really an emotional map that guides you through these stories more than anything else. I know you're bilingual. Mm -hmm. Are there phrases, words better said in one language than another? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> there are there are things that simply don't exist in one language, and they might in another, um, which I've always found fascinating because sometimes you don't have an access, you don't ha you, there are ways, for example, in English, things that we all feel that we can't quite put into words, yet the words might exist in another language and how fortunate would we would be if we knew those words to describe what we're feeling. So that's one of the great things about being bilingual or trilingual or whatever. Um, so there are, there are some splashes of you know, um, other languages in, in this book. I like that that you said there are like words we can't come up with. You're mm -hmm. absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well done. Mm -hmm. You win for the best title of a book ever, and the title is It's Not Love, It's Just Paris. <laughs> I'm telling you, fabulous title. Oh, thank okay. you. <laughs> when did you write that book? Uh, it's Not Love, It's Just Paris is my second book. It's a novel. Um, I have to say that was not my original title. The original title was House of Stars, and the line, it's not love, it's just Paris, is a line from the novel that one character says to another. So my editor at the time thought, you know, that would make a better title, so we went with it. Um, and that was published back in 2013, and it's set in Paris, um, and, uh, and it sort of explores that period in life where it's young people abroad studying where they're just full of fascination, yearning for adventure, there's a love story, it's trying to figure out who you are um, as an adult um, at the turn of the millennium. And kudos to your editor. Mm -hmm. When you wrote Infinite Country, it became an instant New York Times bestseller. Mm -hmm. So that's fabulous. Mm -hmm. But does that mean extra pressure? I don't know, it might, and maybe I'm not aware of it, because when you're a writer, it's just you alone with the page every single time. Um, the last book had its own life and its own trajectory, it's, um, and this book will be something else. Um, but if there's pressure, I try to resist it, just so I can really um, be authentic to my creative process and getting the work done. Patricia, we've talked about the book, The mm -hmm. Faraway World. In the few minutes that we have left, I just want to find out a little bit more about you. First one, the favorite place you have ever traveled to. Oh, wow, that's a difficult one. Um, fortunately, I, I've had the opportunity to travel a lot. I think I've been to something like 50 countries. Um, but I have okay. to say probably my favorite, most special place to go to is to my parents' country, it's Colombia. Because of course, that's, um, I, we still have so much family there. It's an absolutely spectacular country with beautiful landscapes and so much eco-diversity. Um, but I always, I always, even though I didn't grow up there, I feel a, a sense of home there. I feel home. What's a place you have never been to but you want to? Oh. So many. But you've been to 50, so there may not be that many left. <laughs> um, I really want to go to Alaska. Um, and, well, that's just one. There are so many okay. places that I, I would love to go to, but I would love to go to Alaska. What's the first book that you remember reading that you could not get out of your mind? Very many. Uh, I would have to say, if I look back, um, the books that arrived in my life around age 14, 15, I think that was a pivotal time in mm -hmm. my reading life and really informed my tastes and who I became as a writer. Um, one of my favorite books that I read around that time for the first time is called The Four-Chambered Heart by Anais Nin. You were reading that as, as, a, as, a, as a teenage my, girl? My mom, okay. <laughs> I have to say my mom um, confiscated my um, 
um, on Ice and in Henry Miller books a couple times, but <laughs> somehow I always recuperated them, but she never took that one away from me, and I, and I loved it. <laughs> we know that you teach as yeah. well as write. What is something that you have learned from your students? Oh, I think the secret to teaching is always being adaptable and <laughs> allowing space for learning from students. Um, I have incredible students this semester, and well, what have they, they've certainly taught me that the world has changed since I was, I was young, because they're right out of high school, many of them. But um, to keep trying, keep experimenting, sometimes I get set in my ways too, and they, they sort of you know, make me shake that off and, and try, try new approaches of writing myself. And the, the final one, one that we have, we are, we are in a situation now mm -hmm where books and are being banned in schools and reading lists are being critiqued. Mm -hmm. In a couple of, of words, your thoughts? Well, and we know you read in nice and as a kid, so. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I think that there's, uh, certainly book banning is nothing new, right? Um, perhaps we're more aware of it now, but there have always been banned books. Um, there's a great danger in silencing and allowing silencing of voices different from your own. Um, so we have to protect that. Um, and at the same time, we also need to be careful of um, allowing violence to exist in, on the page in a way that um, persecutes and preys on vulnerable communities. But um, books are, are not the enemy. <laughs> Patricia Ingalls' new book is A Far Away World. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm Ann Bocock. Please join me on the next Between the Covers. Mm -hmm.